Well, good morning, Living Church. <clears throat> that other guy who usually, usually preaches in, in white shoes uh, always introduces himself, so uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Roger. I have the privilege of being one of your pastors here, and it's opposite day. All right. <laughs> Well, so much has been said about this woman that it's uh, hard to know where to start or what to add to that. But one biographer has said, and I quote, it's hard to see history when you're in the middle of it. It's not hard to understand why this is the biggest thing in the world. It's about redemption, where the hero discovers new happiness, not despite her challenges, but because of them. These hyperventilating, breathless words were written about Time Magazine's Person of the Year, wait for it, Taylor Swift. (laughs) They go on to say these words, quote, she became the main character of the world. Her celebrity emits so much light, it can be blinding. Now, Taylor Swift is famous because She uses an ancient medium to get her message across to the world. She's a multi-billionaire at this point. She writes songs to tell her story. They say, and I quote, she is the master storyteller of the modern era. And she better be because the average concert goer pays $1,300 just to see her in person. Now the question is, will she be as memorable as Time's Person of the Year of 2015? Angela Merkel, or Times Person of the Year 2019, Greta Thunberg, or Times Person of the Year 2020, Kamala Harris, or Times Person of the Year 2006, which was you in all caps, all of you. And how long will her music stay in our memory? Well, there's another young woman who wrote a song, and it's still in our memory. 20 centuries later, in fact, the angel said when she sang this song, from now on, all generations will call you blessed. And every songwriter needs a hook. And Mary had a hook. And the hook is the very first word, at least in Latin. It helps if you know Latin, which I don't. But the very first word of this song is magnificat which means magnify in our language, or in the Greek, it's megalune, which means to make large. So we're going back to the life of a young woman named Mary, Mary who lived in Nazareth. And she's casting this song out there because of what has happened in her life. And she's making large who God is. That's what magnify means. There's two ways to make things large. One is to take something very tiny that you can't quite see with your eye, put it under a microscope, magnify it so that you can see it and study it. But there's another way to make things large, and that is to take something so immense, so distant, so foreign to us that we can barely see it with our eyes and use a telescope to bring it close so that we can study the design that we've never seen before. We can see the purpose of its existence. And so Mary is magnifying the Lord. She's not making a small God bigger. She's making an immense Lord close. She's magnifying the Lord in her own life. If you're able to stand with me, let's read her song. It comes in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, and behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is God's word preserved for us. You may be seated. Mary draws the Lord close and magnifies him, but this needs some context. As you probably know, there's been 400 years of prophetic silence. Now, it isn't that God wasn't working, it's that he hadn't given any fresh revelation since the book of Malachi. Then he comes and appears through Gabriel, the angel, to Zechariah, who's been elected the high priest that year, and he's going into the Holy of Holies. And while he's there, Gabriel reveals to him, hey, Zechariah, you and your wife Elizabeth, though you're very old, you're going to bear a son. And Zechariah laughs at him, as you recall. The angel goes on to say, his name will be John. He'll be the forerunner. He'll come in the spirit and power of Elijah as promised in Malachi. And he will go before the Lord to prepare the way for the Messiah. Well, six months later, this same divine obstetrical assistant named Gabriel appears to Mary. And here's what he says. If you're following along in your your mobile device or your Bible, in Luke 131, it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The angel delivers to Mary this news also that her relative Elizabeth is in her sixth month of pregnancy, and she knows that Elizabeth is elderly and and really beyond childbearing age, and the angel gives this solid theological rock to Mary. He says, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. He knows Mary's doubts and fears, and he gives her this deep theological reminder. Then she goes to see Elizabeth in her town in, in Judea, in Judah, And Elizabeth declares three times, Mary, you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed, meaning she's happy and favored by God. And remember, the baby leapt in her womb. The baby leapt in her womb. About half the people in this room might understand what that feels like. (laughs) We know that when children are 18 months or 18 weeks of age, they can hear a heartbeat and they recognize their mother's heartbeat. When they have when they're 27 weeks in the womb, they can hear voices and other sounds outside the womb. And by the time they're full term, they can hear as well as, as just about any adult and better than most married men. <laughs> and they respond. They respond to music. They respond to the mood of their mother. And many of you know that there are many gymnastics that a, a prenatal child can do in the womb. Well, this happens. And so here we have this confluence of the earthly and the angelic, this confluence of the human and the supernatural, the confluence of the common and the prophetic. So the common part of this is the doubts and struggles and shock of Mary and Elizabeth and Zechariah and Joseph and all these people who've been visited by these angels. And they, it was probably a very natural thing for Mary to want to escape the gossip and the whisperings of Nazareth to go to visit her cousin in, in Judah. And they needed the assurance of one another because they were, they were in, the, in the confluence of this huge undertaking. But it also has the angelic and the supernatural because the, this news is gobsmackingly huge to them. That's our vocabulary for the day, gobsmack. It's a, it's a Scottish word, Heather. It, it, it comes from the Scottish word, gob means mouth, and it's like, well, shut my mouth. Something has happened so huge that you're thunderstruck. You, you, you don't know what to say. It, it overwhelms you. You're, you're gobsmacked, and that's what happens to Mary. But listen to John's words. They stun us with what they say in this context. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the most unfathomable, the pro- profoundest look into the depths of our Christian claims that here is the plurality of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father and the Spirit sending the Son. And then also on top of that, we have deity and humanity, the Godhead and the personhood of Jesus united in one person without mixture, without diminishment, without change. These are the profoundest truths that we find in the scripture, and it's staggering. And, and Mary is convinced enough from scripture, from the angelic visit, from Elizabeth's testimony, and that the forerunner is going to be born, and Elizabeth is pregnant, and now Mary has a baby bump, that all this is reality, that all this is happening, and she is gobsmacked. She is bowled over. She is overwhelmed that the mightiest one has drawn near, that the highest has stooped low, that the holiest has chosen her. And she begins to sing. And she remembers themes from the Old Testament. She was well versed in the Psalms. Some commentators have said, you know, Mary plagiarized the whole song. Well, you're not plagiarizing when you're quoting scripture. And she talks about this tapestry of joy and praise, this this spun glass, this tapestry that God is making, this beautiful purpose and design that he's made in the birth of this child. So as we look at the song, we want to see what Mary magnifies. So first of all, Mary magnifies the fact that Jesus is the turning point of all time. He's the turning point of all time. He certainly spun her around. (laughs) She had no idea as a young teenager that she was about to become a wife, much less a pregnant teenager betrothed to a, to a man. She had no idea what was going to happen. This was the turning point of her life when God visited her. Here's what it says in verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She contrasts her humble estate with the mighty one visiting her. And all generations will be blessed by this song, and she is blessed. Now, here's an argument for another time, but I want you to notice something in the text. Mary is the one who is blessed. She's not the source of blessing. Mary is not full of grace. She is filled with grace. Mary is not the dispenser of grace. She has now put herself at the feet to be a disciple of the one who gives grace. He who is mighty has done great things for me. And then immediately she broadens it out from herself to everyone else in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. The arrival of the Messiah is the turning point in all time, in all history, for all nations, for all generations, for all ethnic groups, for every person on earth. It's the turning point when we see what God is doing It turns our lives around. Listen to the beautiful words of Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there, will, there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
But Mary, even as she recognizes that everything has changed about her life, she recognizes that this is not the first appearance of the Son of God. Yes, it's his first incarnation, his only incarnation where God of the universe becomes the Son in the flesh, but his life didn't begin in Bethlehem. His ministry didn't start in those, first, those three years of discipleship with his disciples. Jesus was here already. He didn't begin here in his birth. Listen to John 1, verses 9 and 10. The true light which, was, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Are you ready for your gaskets to explode? Mary is recognizing, yes, this is God, the creator who's come into my womb to be born as a baby. How do you fathom the majesty of that? As she draws him close, as she magnifies the implications of this truth, it is so immense. She can't quite contain it, but she sings it out. Someone has said, if, the, if you took these proportions, if the earth was the size of a basketball, then the sun would be 110 feet in diameter. So that would be like from that door to this back wall. That's how big the sun would be in comparison to the earth. And it would be a two and a half miles away. And Pluto would be the size of a tennis ball and be 90 miles away. But the nearest star would be 600,000 miles away if the earth was the size of a basketball. And think of the size of the galaxies. Think of creation that is being magnified through the wonderful telescopes that we have today. Think of the design and the beauty and the billions upon billions of galaxies and trillions of stars that God knows each by name. Are you gobsmacked by this? Mary was. This is not his first appearance. He was there at creation. But now are you really ready for your synapses to sizzle? Because we even go back before creation. 2 Timothy 1.9. He saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ, are you ready for it? Before the ages began. One translation says, before the beginning of time. Now, I don't know about you, I can, I can project a little bit toward a future eternity because, you know, I, I've lived almost an eternity, but... I can project a little while. I can think of what would life be like if I had just more of it. But it's impossible for me to think there was eternity in the past. No, there was no beginning. There was no creation of the Son. There was no creation of the Father or of the Spirit of God. Eternity in the past This is the size when Mary magnifies the Lord and draws him close. She is absolutely overwhelmed. And then in Colossians 1.16, we have these words. That he's the very glue of the universe. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. Things and in him all things hold together. So his is not only the birth in Bethlehem, his is the creation, his is the sustenance of the world, his is the providence over all history, his is the exhaustive foreknowledge of every molecule ever created. Gobsmacked. That's what Mary is. And now Mary looks closely and draws this miracle of conception into a larger framework. And behold, eternity is coming into time. 
deity is coming into history. The creator has become a baby. The immensity has come into the manger and the supernatural is now. And the implications for us are enormous as well. When we stop and we think about the Lord God who often is hovering out there, at least in our minds, so far away. He's, we know he's real. We know he's spoken. But we really haven't drawn him close to see that he is the turning point of our time as well. He wants me to have a completely different perspective on the troubles and challenges of my life. The simplest phrase the angel said to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. Is he the turning point in your life? Is he the turning point in your life right now to change your perspective from a a flat earth horizontalism to a magnification that draws him close and his power, his majesty, his beauty, and his authority reigns in your life. Mary magnifies the Lord. Well, there's a second way in which Mary magnifies the Lord, and that is this. She magnifies the reality that Jesus is the starting point of all salvation. He's the starting point. He's the initiator. There is no start unless Jesus starts it. We cannot effect, we cannot manipulate, we cannot bring about our own salvation. Some of you will remember where you were on October 14th, 1987. Not by the date, but by the occasion. The place is Midland, Texas, and a little 18-month toddler named Jessica McClure toddled in her aunt's backyard and fell into an eight-inch oil well pipe. She went down 22 feet and she was trapped in there. One leg was over her head. Fortunately, she was practicing yoga and she was a baby, so she was limber. She could do that, but they thought they could get her out quickly, but that just didn't work. She was stuck in the pipe. Then they discovered that traditional drilling wouldn't work. They wanted to drill a parallel shaft and then come over and get her out of the pipe, but the the well had been drilled through solid rock. Finally, a mining engineer arrived with a new technology called water jet, jet cutting. They cut through the rock in a parallel way, and they, they dug a channel over and cut a hole in the pipe. And 58 hours later, Jessica McClure was rescued. Now, the amazing thing about that story is that the entire world was focused. Live television was focused every hour of every day on this drama. How will she be saved? We prayed and we prayed for Jessica McClure. And praise God, she was saved. She's a 30-something woman today. Think about that as a picture. When you are stuck, when you are helpless, when you're in the dark, when you are hostage, you are alienated, you are hopelessly indebted, When you are somehow declared helpless, you cannot affect your own salvation. Salvation needs to be affected by someone outside ourselves. And here's what Mary sings in verse 50 to 53. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is all about God's initiative and our helplessness. The scripture says we are people trapped in a pipe. We are dead. We're helpless. And we're not only physically alienated, we are spiritually at war with God. He has no reason to come for us, but he does. And Jesus is the starting point of this salvation. You know the verse, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son 
that whoever believes in him should not be stuck and alienated and in the dark, but shall receive eternal life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, vandals, runaways, hopeless, Christ died for us and reconciled us to himself. In Mary's song, we see this unique confluence of mercy and strength. Take the example of Jessa McClure. It was the mercy in the hearts of those mining engineers that caused them to think about her, but it was the strength of the tools and the purposes that they did that actually rescued her. And this is the, the, the message of salvation. It isn't just happy thoughts in dark times. It's mercy, yes, but it's strength as well. The mercy sees our desperation and remembers that we are dust. But the strength protects us and stands guard over us when we are dependent, spiritually vulnerable in a, in a condition called humility. When we finally say, I cannot help myself, and we release ourselves to God, we are utterly vulnerable. And Jesus says, I've got you now. I will hold you. You're sheep of my pasture. I have you in my grip. I will not let you go. I have mercy on you, and I have the strength to bring you home forever. Now, Mary no doubt knew Psalm chapter 2. And Psalm 2 is about the opposition that this great offer of salvation gets from others. It's the nations. It says this, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against the anointed. There's a resistance to this great offer of salvation. Why? Because we like to run our own world. We like the authority of our own voice and our own ideas. We love the fact that we think we know the way, and so many resist this. And here's what it says in verse 4 of Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And he announces that I have set my king. A son is born who will be your salvation. Mary is magnifying the salvation of the Lord, that he is the one where it all begins. He initiates this, and he who sits in heaven has designed this for our sake and for the world. Jesus is the way. And one day, at the name of Jesus, the name above all names, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord indeed. Mary saw all this passing by her in the midst of all of her confusion and struggle. She saw that this was the majestic thing that God was doing. Well, finally, Mary sees another thing that she magnifies in this passage, and that is that Jesus is the central point of all worship. Jesus is the central point of all worship. He's the turning point of all time. He's the starting point of all salvation, and he is the central point of all worship. Back to the beginning, verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Because Mary's mind is filled with the truth, and she has enough evidence to cause her faith to burgeon inside of her. She's heard the prophets. She has heard the angel. She's had the confirmation from Elizabeth. She has her own baby bump that's growing. She's, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She has all of this going along with the prophets and all the Psalms that confirm that. And her mind is convinced so that her heart can rejoice. Now, Josh McDowell is famous for saying, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects as false. But what the mind affirms as true frees the heart to rejoice. And that's exactly what's happening with Mary. And she must have remembered Psalm 34, the Psalm of David, where he says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. 
let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And so Mary utters magnificat in the Latin, oh, magnify in our language. In the Greek, it's mega lune, magnify the Lord. A friend of mine suggested recently that we all should have a pronoun app. Not for all the third person pronouns, like they, them, and those, and all that, but a first person pronoun app. You know, like, like your phone keeps track of your screen time? This would keep track of the times you use the words I, me, and my to, to track your selfishness. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good idea. And actually, it would not apply to Mary. Because look, at, she uses the first person pronoun three times. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Why? Because she has brought God close to her, and it is utterly personal. She is worshiping him in all of his majesty and all of her amazement. She brings her gratitude straight to him. I have two daughters, uh, and uh, they're, in fact, today is one of their birthdays. And then when they were small girls, they started going to school. And so my daughter, Jill, who was six years old, started going to first grade. And she was a very studious young girl. And she would go to school in the daytime, and she would come home every afternoon and teach first grade to her younger sister, Shelly. So Shelly got double dose of, of first grade. And they did that all, they played school all the time. And, and Jill, my older daughter, had a desk that my wife Joanne had received as a child. It's a little desk, it's a little roll top desk with a little chair, just the size of a six year old. Well, Shelly didn't have a desk, and I knew she wanted a desk. So it was about Christmas time, and when they were in bed, I sneaked out to the garage and I built Shelly a, a little desk that I wanted to give her at Christmas. So we were gathered around opening all of our gifts, which we do on the prescribed sanctified day when you're supposed to open your gifts, which is Christmas Eve, right? <laughs> and we'd opened all of our gifts and this, you know, the leftovers were everywhere. We had one left to go because I couldn't wrap this desk up. So I told Shelly, I said, Shelly, you stand there in the room and put your hands over your eyes like this. And I, br I brought the desk and I set it right in front of her between her and me. And I said, okay, Shelly, you can opened your eyes, and she opened her eyes, and her big blue eyes flew open. She looked at the desk and did, did something totally, totally surprised me. She went around the desk, and she jumped into my arms and said, oh, thank you, Daddy. I'll never forget that, not only for what it meant to me, but the picture that is. Then instead of focusing on all the gifts, she magnified the giver. Mary says, oh, magnify the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary magnifies the Lord by saying that Jesus is the central point of all worship. Along with David and the angels and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and Zechariah and Elizabeth, oh, magnify the Lord. Let's exalt his name together. Because Jesus came not to make an entrance, but to make a difference. Jesus came not to remain a baby, but to become the victor over sin and death. Jesus came not to remain dependent, but to become my deliverer and yours. Oh, magnify the Lord. So how will you magnify Jesus in your life today? Well, maybe it's because you bring him close and you recognize everything I have, every talent I've been given, every part of my body that works, all the blessings, opportunities, the freedom, and the place I live, all of this is from him, what do I have that I have not received? Magnify the Lord. Bring that cloudy, distant deity 
close to you and recognize and magnify him in the blessings that you've received. Maybe the way you're going to magnify the Lord is by bringing him close to you in your neediness. Pouring out your heart to a merciful Savior who hears you in your brokenness, your loneliness, your betrayal, your exhaustion, your confusion. And he says to you in his mercy the same sentence every single time. You are loved with a love you couldn't earn and therefore can never lose. Oh, magnify the Lord in your neediness. Don't push him away. Bring him close. Maybe you magnify the Lord by sharing with him your fears. Fears for your children, our grandchildren. Fears about the future. Fears of a world that is at war. Fears about the unraveling of a way of life that we thought would always be stable. And we need to hear from him as we draw him close. Nothing is impossible with God. I will never leave you or forsake you. Trust in the rock of your salvation because it is certain and sure. When we magnify the Lord, when we draw him close, when we turn to him unashamedly for his strength and his purpose in our life, he will never disappoint. He will always give us an answer. And when we magnify the Lord... It miniaturizes me and makes him as great as he ought to have been all along. Well, let's pray together. Lord, I confess, I do not draw out and savor your majesty as I ought. But I thank you, Lord, that you are always close and you're always available I pray for all of us today, Lord, that we can see you more clearly again, that in all the busyness that we are encountering, that we will magnify the Lord and draw you close and savor the truth that only you have. Thank you, Father, for your oversight of this congregation and over each one of us, and now we ask your mercy and your strength to help us walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are so thankful that you've worshiped with us today, and at the end of our service, we'll have a worship team, a a prayer team available if you'd like to pray with someone over a need or maybe over rejoicing. You just want to share that with someone else. We also have a section across the, the commons where we have a care ministry that would be willing to talk with you this morning. Uh, we are so thankful you're here. God is meeting all of us right now. Let's, let's close in a time of worship together.